I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, unfortunately, the mayor is unavailable for this evening, so I will. I am acting chair for this meeting. Um, so, any late items to add to the agenda? No late items. Right. And I have approval of the agenda as written, please. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Motion carried. So we will move right on into Municipal Finance Overview, number four. So uh, do we want to talk about the process for tonight and tomorrow before I get into that? Yes, okay, okay exactly. So we always book uh, for this uh, presentation or for these presentations two evenings. Um, and a lot of times we haven't needed the second evening, so if we get done tonight, then that means we don't have to come back tomorrow. But we don't want to rush through it. I mean, we want everybody to ask as many questions as you feel comfortable with. So knowing that we have tomorrow night um, to continue on. And um, in speaking with uh, the acting mayor, um, if we don't get finished tonight and we have to have some presentations happen tomorrow, we will end tonight with public input so that the people that are here um, can do that tonight instead of waiting till tomorrow. And we will do questions after each section, uh, and once we get to the core summary, after each uh, right. each department, we'll have a question period from the council. And because I'm going to do the budget overview <coughs> section, and, and because it's a little more lengthy, um, feel free to ask questions all the way through it, and don't wait till the end because it, it could be a while. <laughs> so um, if we're ready to get started, then I'll I'll just. Um, Get started. So, um, municipal finance, uh, we do fund accounting, and fund accounting is used by nonprofit organizations and gov governments, and it pro promotes accountability rather than profitability. So, it's just a, a different form of accounting uh, that's used. And a fund is a self balancing set of accounts, and funds are created in order to segregate money for different or specific uses. Um, so our, we have three types of funds. We have operating funds, we have capital funds, and we have reserve funds. And then we have reserve accounts. And I'll go through each of these and describe them in more detail. Um, but I wanted to start with operating funds. So in operating funds, we have two operating funds. We have an, a general operating fund and a sewer operating fund. That means all of our general expenditures go through the general operating fund and sewer operating expenditures go through the sewer fund. So we keep those two um, uh, sets of monies separate, separated so that we know exactly how much we spent on, on uh, sewer operations and how much on general operations. The same is true of the capital funds. We have two capital funds. We have a general capital fund and we have sewer capital. So um, when Public Works and Engineering um, is doing that work on the piping under the roads, that would be recorded through your, your sewer capital fund. If you're purchasing um, general capital, uh, like vehicles or other sorts of things, that would go through your general capital fund. And again, those are separated just uh, because of the use of the money. Now, um, reserve funds, we currently have eight. And I will go through each of them and explain what they're used for and what the balances are in each of those funds. Um, and we have two reserve accounts. Now the different, difference between reserve funds and reserve accounts is that reserve funds are established by bylaw. The money can only be spent through resolution of council. Reserve accounts, we have two of those right now and I'll go through those in more detail later. But reserve accounts don't aren't established by bylaw and they don't require a council resolution other than budget approval to spend that money. Um, and reserve accounts is for um, funds that we want to keep separate and use for specific uses, but they're not as restrictive as a reserve fund. Um, and that'll become more evident as I go through the details of that. Lori? Yeah. Ms. Hurst? Okay, thank you. I'm through the chair. Okay, Ms. Hurst. Um, I wondered whether, in fact, with reserve accounts, if there's any rules that um, are required by, by the municipality. Um, there are rules that are required, not necessarily by the municipality, but 
Um, we have one reserve account that we have put rules on. We have another reserve account that ha has rules that comes from the province. So, and I'll explain that as I go into them. So there are some rules, but they aren't governed by bylaw, and they don't have to have a specific resolution to spend them. Thank you. So within the municipal budget, um, you'll notice uh, you've got uh, binders that were distributed tonight. Um, and as you go through them, there's, there's some detail in there of the, with the budget. And um, especially in section two, five, and six, you'll see that um, we split um, the budget into core, supplemental, and prior year. And core is your, and, and that's what each of the directors will, or department heads will be doing presentations on tonight. Core budget is what, you're, what you require to deliver your basic services within your department. Um, and they're your core operating expenditures. Supplemental, <coughs> sorry. And the difference between core and, and supplemental. Supplemental is funding required to increase the level of service. So it increases personnel, it increases um, material and laborers. It's some sort of increase that um, elevates your level of service. And supplemental items, and you'll see this, we won't be dealing with specific supplemental items or capital items until March 6th and 7th. Um, council goes through each supplemental request and each capital request line by line. So you'll, we'll, we'll take you through that. Um, some supplemental requests will, if approved, then become a core, in, in, in the next year become a core function. Let's say if you approve a new staff position, it's a supplemental request this year, but once you've approved it, it's ongoing, it now becomes core. Or you have one-time supplementals, which is purchasing a new vehicle that increases the number of vehicles we have in the fleet, or something to that effect. Um, and then sometimes you have a mixture of two in that if you approve a vehicle, um, it's a one-time capital supplemental request, but it results in ongoing core operating and maintenance uh, costs from then, then on. So it, it's important to be aware of those things when you're approving them, that, that sometimes when you approve things, it's an ongoing, it's not just a one-time expenditure. And those are all itemized. The budget is all broken down into core supplemental and prior year. Prior year is just something that was approved in last year's budget and the money did not get expended in the current year. The project didn't get finished. Um, workload uh, prevented it from happening. Something prevented that from happening. So because the, um, the funds were collected, taxes were collected to pay for that project, then that project is brought forward to this year so that it can be completed in this budget year. Clear? Does that all make sense? Okay. Um, so, capital expenditures. So, as I said before, we have capital expenditures. Um, capital expenditures can be recorded in two ways. Capital expenditures can be recorded as part of our operating fund, and that is if we need to collect taxes to pay for them. Um, our tax rates are calculated and based on um, total expenditures contained in our operating fund. If a capital item is, we don't need to collect taxes to pay for it, if we have money in reserves that we're going to use to pay for it, or we have grant money, or we have some other source of revenue other than taxes, then we report it in the capital fund. So um, in the operating fund, in the general operating fund, um, expenditures are pretty much self-explanatory and expenditures are divided into um, each of the departments um, and you'll see that in the details that are contained in your, um, in your binders, I think in sections five and six, especially section five which is your operating funds. Revenue is a little more convoluted. So here are the majority of the sources of our revenue. We have municipal property taxes, which also include 1% utility taxes and the federal PILT payment that we get. Um, we also separate out any new growth that we have 
in taxes. So your tax increase, your tax increase is based on those properties that existed in the prior year and how much you're increasing their taxes. Any brand new development, new housing stock doesn't form part of that, that, that percentage that we calculate. So we separate it out on the budget so that you can see how much of our tax revenue is coming from that new development. Uh, Councilor Hodgins has a question. Well, just a point for clarification, some people may not understand. The, oh, PILT. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so PILT is payment in lieu of taxes and it's for those federal or provincial properties that don't generally pay property taxes. What they do is they pay us the equivalent to what they would have paid if they were taxable. We send them what the tax rates are and they um, go through their calculations and they send us um, what would be equivalent if we sent them a tax notice. Yeah, just on that, um, obviously, uh, the Department of National Defense, federal government, is the biggest yes. uh, client in that, using health. Do we have any other clients? Um, we have um, some BC housing that pays uh, a small portion. Um, the liquor store pays a small oh, portion. Stores. Yes. Okay. Um, so the other ones are very small, pales in significance to the um, to the federal D and D one that we get, which is normally in the neighborhood of I think a total of six million. We don't keep all of all of that. That goes to we also collect uh, pilt um, taxes for CRD, MFA, all those other school tax, all those other agencies. So. Thank you. Um, so we also have in our in our uh, sources of revenue of sales sales of service, which includes a cost recovery fees and charges, and parks and rec program fees. We have revenue from our own sources, which is licenses and permits from development. So when um, development permits come through and, and those fees are paid by the developers, we also have other revenue. We get um, and I'll get into this later when I go through the reserve accounts. We get money from um, through view through, through the casino in View Royal. So we get a percentage. We have a, a revenue sharing agreement where we get a portion of, of the, those funds, um, donations, and community works fund. And that's another one of our reserve accounts that I'll go into later. But that's um, money that comes to us um, from the provincial government and through UBCM. Um, we have unconditional transfers, which is um, again. Um, money from other levels of, of government, and that is based on our population. So you get a, um, a, a provincial grant based on your population. Um, and we have traffic fine revenue sharing uh, agreement that we also get from the provincial government. Um, we have conditional transfers, which is any grant funding that we've been successful in obtaining for any of our special projects. And transfers and collections for other governments. Um, and that really makes up um, all of our sources of revenue. Um, the traffic fine uh, revenue, so that, for most communities it's very, um, very clear because they have their own police force and they only take it within their own municipal boundaries and so the provincial government knows exactly how much money to send back to that local municipality. Okay. We're, as everyone knows, a bit of a different situation here. We have Big PD, uh, some of their tickets they issue on the Squimal area and some, a lot of them they issue in Victoria, Victoria's jurisdiction. So how does the provincial government figure out, do they look at where the events took place and or how does that happen? No, the traffic fine revenue that we receive is based on the same formula that our cost sharing uh, formula is based on. Okay. And up until, I think it was 2006, we didn't even get that money at all. 100% of it went straight to Victoria. Okay. It was only after uh, the township lobbied the provincial government that they agreed to split it and send us our portion. Okay, so roughly 15%. Yeah. Okay. And and right now, um, and Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about three hundred and forty-five, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars is what we put put in in the budget for that. Yeah, three sixty-six. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. So now we'll get into the reserve funds, the the eight reserve funds that we have that are governed um, by bylaw. So reserve funds are established by bylaw. 
Money in the funds can only be spent on those items that are specified in the bylaw. The money can't be spent on anything else. And there has to be a council resolution to uh, spend the funds. Um, the bylaws governing the reserve funds are included in your binders under section three. And there's a summary in there of the fund balances as well that we'll get more into explaining um, later tonight, as well as on the 6th and 7th, we'll go through those balances and how the budget requests will impact those balances. Um, so the first, first uh, reserve fund is our capital projects reserve fund. And obviously the title is, is a little self-explanatory. Um, how that fund, or that reserve fund receives its um, balance is that a number of years ago, um, and it preceded my coming to the municipality in 2004, so it was a council directive that happened earlier than 2004, where what the municipality did is every time they paid off, made their final debt payment on some borrowing, instead of reducing um, the expenditure, what they did is they took the equivalent to the debt payment and started contributing it to this capital projects reserve fund which was um, a great idea at the time because we have a very, uh, that's how we pay for the majority of our capital projects reserves and it has no, um, it doesn't result in a tax rate spike each year when we have, sometimes some years we have a lot of capital project requests, other years we don't. So instead of spiking up and down, we're able to use the reserve fund to, um, to be more consistent. We also contribute to that fund um, portion of the HST, which will now become, go back to the GST. But as a municipality, we qualify for a rebate on the GST that we pay on our goods and services that we purchase throughout the year. So that rebate, when we get it back, when we make those claims, then goes back into this reserve fund to fund more capital projects. Councilor uh, Lundley. Thank you, through you to Ms. Hurst. Um, in, in Concerning the uh, Capital Project Reserve Fund, does that cover then most of our infrastructure needs? Absolutely. So, Are we still underfunded when it comes to our capital assets? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. The answer is yes to both of those questions, if that's where you were going. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and that's, uh, just, just to highlight that a bit, that's a national problem, the underfunding of our, not that that's an excuse for us uh, not having that, um, but that's why the, the recording of de depreciation of assets was, was started. Um, we started working on that project, what was it, two years ago now, three years ago now? Oh. Three years ago now, where um, governments now have to start depreciating their assets and putting money away to replace them because nobody was doing it up until uh, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, so that's, that's about all I can contribute on that. We're still underfunded. We don't have enough in this fund, let's say, to replace all of our sewer infrastructure or to replace our rec center or to re replace our sports center if we needed to. Um, machinery and Equipment Depreciation Reserve Fund. This, um, again, is uh, a fund that is specifically used to replace any machinery and equipment in the municipality, including all our fleet vehicles and any other piece of equipment that contributes to the fund. So um, how this fund uh, receives its money is we do internal allocations on all of our equipment. So if, um, and Jeff's gonna, gonna correct me if I'm wrong on this on equipment, but if, if one department, let's say the parks department is using a piece of equipment, of equipment and they need it for three months and it goes, it, it's rented out at a rate of um, $300 a day, then that gets charged to the parks and rec budget and that, and it's, it's really just a flow through, but it allows us to really keep track of the wear and tear on our equipment and how um, to replace that equipment. We also have some external um, charges that we do. For instance, if, and again, Jeff, you can correct me if my terminology is wrong, but it, let's say we're paving, uh, we have a road project and we're paving the road and a uh, private residents wants to have their driveway drop redone, then we can tell them that'll cost you $3,000 because that's what the equipment, using the equipment and the materials cost, and then they pay us that $3,000. That money goes um, back into this to replace that, the usage on that equipment. Um, 
and really the amount that we decide to contribute to this fund on an annual basis is based on the useful life of whatever piece of equipment it is and the replacement cost that the, say a vehicle has a, a useful life of 10 years and what will it, what are we predicting it will cost to replace that asset at the end of 10 years and then we figure out how much we have to put in annually to be able in 10 years to replace that piece of equipment. Okay, I have Councillor Mackay and then Emily. Yeah, thank you. Um, on your uh, replacement, you said you charge back to uh, the landowners. <clears throat> is that set down on an hourly basis or how does that work out? Uh, I'm going to pass that question to Jeff and, and have him answer that. Uh, I would depend on what we're doing at the time. Uh, a lot of things we do have set rates already established. If there is, say for a driveway let down, there is a set rate uh, if it's a standard one, so that would be built into that cost. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, to Ms. Hurst. In the context of the comments that you've just made, can you speak a little bit about our new fire truck? Because a fire truck costs a lot, a million and something. Mm -hmm. So could you just provide a little background? Sure. Um, uh, fire truck is, is the, despite the, um, well, I was going to use the astronomical cost, but you wouldn't like that, would you? Despite the higher cost, I mean, it's a specialized piece of equipment. It costs more than, than a regular truck would cost. But that doesn't change the way that we contribute to the fund for that vehicle. Um, the fire department, and I don't know um, if, if, the last time that I did it, which was a couple of years ago, or I looked at it a couple of years ago, it was, you basically had a 10 year replacement plan. Which pieces of equipment have to get replaced each of those years? What's the replacement cost? So how much money do we have to have in that fund at the end of 10 years, including any resale value or recovery value um, for that piece of equipment, assuming that it still has some value at the end but can't be used as a frontline piece of equipment. Um, it's, you, so you, you figure out at the end of 10 years how much money you need to replace each of those pieces of equipment and then you figure out how much has to go into that into this fund in order to meet those obligations over those 10 years. So really the philosophy and the formula is the exact same for every piece of equipment regardless of what the cost is. You just have to contribute more based on. Um, and I think, um, and, and the chief can correct me if I'm wrong or Mary can correct me, but I believe the contribution annually to the replacement fund just for fire department vehicles is $115,000? Okay, And so that's what we've determined needs to go into that fund every year in order to um, keep on top of replacing our equipment at the end of its useful life. So um, having said that, so you bring up this, this other part that I should probably explain, explain. Well, we have a capital projects reserve fund that has a balance of, let's say for sake of argument, there's a $2 million balance in there. That balance then within that fund may be segregated for different items. You don't just sort of throw the $2 million into one fund and say there's $2 million for capital projects reserve fund. Some of that money within that reserve fund is there for a specific purpose. And that applies also to the machinery and equipment depreciation reserve fund. Because otherwise we would have um, probably very respectful disagreements, but we would have um, fighting amongst our departments as to how much money is attributable to each of their departments or for each function. So within the Machinery and Equipment Depreciation Reserve Fund, for example, we have a certain amount of money out of that overall balance that's allocated specifically to the fire department. We have another part of that fund that's specifically allocated for fleet vehicles or public works and engineering. We have another section that's specifically to replace um, um, uh, information technology equipment, your computers and the rest of that. So, um, so while the balance of the fund may be two million dollars, there's specifically so much of that funding that is for specific uses. Councilor Hanby. Thank you. So then, following along with that, given that all of this money or the funds are designated within that fund. Um, would the municipality be able to use it for emergency contingency or contingency could we use it whenever we felt like it? Um, what are the rules around that? Absolutely. So um, the rules, um, 
for the reserve funds, so just, just let, let me say that not 100% of every balance in the reserve funds is allocated. We do have a, an unallocated portion that hasn't been attributed to anything. But we like each of the departments to stay within the money that they have in that fund. Otherwise, what we should do as staff, if, if the IT department comes forward and says, we need to replace all of our servers this year because otherwise it's going to crash and we're going to have no um, equipment, and it's going to cost 100000 their portion of that fund is only 50000 then we as staff have to go back and say, okay, we need to recalculate what a replacement is, and we adjust that. And we look at that every year. We look at, at whether we're appropriately funding um, different things. Um, now, moving money around within those funds. We have, those restrictions that are in those funds are self-restrictions. So nobody's telling us we have to do that. It was a conscious uh, decision. So can you change that if the need arose? Absolutely. You can even, um, you couldn't do it up until about 10 years ago. Um, but you can if money, if you've got a $5 million balance in one reserve fund and a $2 million balance in another reserve fund and you decide that you don't need that full amount that's in the one reserve fund for that specific purpose, you can as a council say, take that money out of that reserve fund and put it in this other reserve fund. You couldn't do that until about 10 years ago because reserve funds were not only established by bylaw, but they were regulated by the province. And municipal councils were not allowed to transfer money in between, between reserve funds. Now you can do that if you determine that the use for which the reserve fund was established is no longer valid. So you can make that decision. So you have that portability amongst the, the between the reserve funds. You can also, if the need arose, and it doesn't arise very often, you also can borrow money from your reserve fund for something that is totally different than what that reserve fund was established for. So let's say you needed money, short-term borrowing, which is five years or less, um, and that's what it has to be if you borrow from a reserve fund. Let's say you decided you wanted to do some project that doesn't fall under any of the bylaws that established your reserve fund. You can borrow that money out of a reserve fund and you pay it back over five years, just like you borrowed from a bank. Councillor Hodgins? Uh, just a question with respect to uh, the standards that you would apply when you look at replacement, and, uh, whether it's uh, public works vehicles or fire department vehicles. Well, I know for fire department there are some standards. What, what do you use? Is there a, an industry standard that one would look to to suggest that it would ballpark uh, a pickup truck or a fire unit? I think those are, are specific to, to the departments. Um, we don't have, and I'll let each of you speak to your standards. What, what we do have corporately is, and, I don't, and we haven't actually finalized it, but we, our sustainability coordinator has been working on a, a green purchasing policy under which a lot of vehicles um, will fall, and that establishes a standard to which, um, and, and a matrix, but I think other than that, we don't have a corporate policy on standards for vehicles, and I don't know if you want to add anything on that, Jeff. The life of a vehicle, it depends on its use, um, what it is, and such. There are some guidelines, I guess you could call them, that come through asset management and through other sources. What we do is we will establish uh, a lifespan for a vehicle, but as it nears the end of its lifespan, we also look at it from a maintenance standpoint and see if it's in good condition and still fulfills its function, we can extend past that lifespan. So the lifespan is really a, a yardstick to give us some place to go, um, but as we get closer to it, we may extend that by two, three, possibly even five years if uh, the vehicle has been underutilized or such. And, and just to add to that, and, and Jeff brought up something that I had forgotten about, um, which was quite interesting because when, um, when I first came here, we had a 20-year um, vehicle replacement plan. So it was every vehicle that was going to be replaced over the next 20 years. And it, each, each piece of equipment had been slotted into a specific year. When that specific year came, that vehicle was disposed of and a new one was purchased. They didn't do what Jeff 
um, now does, which is took a look at the vehicle to see if maybe it had been used less than we thought it would have been. Maybe it'll last for three years longer. They didn't have a mechanic, uh, the mechanics look at it to determine if it still had two or three or four more years of useful life. Um, and now we do do that on, a, on an active basis, just to make sure that we're not simply replacing vehicles because that's the year it was supposed to be replaced. Uh, okay, I think, um, oh, just on the machinery and equipment depreciation reserve fund. So there are some um, external, and that means external outside of our own borders, jobs that we do, and you talk about sharing services, and we do um, quite a bit of that with Pew Oil. We have shared services when we use our equipment. We charge, we charge them for it, we invoice them, we do a work order, and when we're charging um, uh, another municipality for work that we've done, we also uh, charge administration fees for administer doing the invoicing and doing the collecting, so we, that, again, that money goes back into this uh, reserve fund to replace our equipment. So, reserve funds continued. So we have a Parkland Acquisition Reserve Fund, and this is funded from the sale of any uh, parkland that we do, or, and Barb can get into more detail about this, it's money that we get in lieu of parkland for new development. And that goes into this fund. Right now, the balance in this fund, and you'll see this a little later when I bring up the balances, is not large because we did use uh, the most of the balance in this to purchase that uh, piece of property um, just outside of, of Lampson Park. Well, it's now part of Lampson Park, isn't it? It has been rezoned, and it's where the house was, and we, and we took the house down. Um, now, in order to replenish that fund, we have to dispose of an alternate piece of land that we own. Um, and so the bylaw governing this reserve fund, you can only buy parkland. You cannot buy uh, a piece of commercial property. You cannot buy a residential. It has to be, if you buy it as residential, it has to, uh, what has to happen is the process that Scott went through where immediately it was rezoned and, and became parkland. Um, the Municipal Archives Trust Fund is simply uh, funded by donations, um, and it and that those monies can only be used for acquisition, restoration, reproduction, and equipment for archives. It's a relatively small balance, um, and I think it's only been used once since I've been here. I think it was for an expenditure of about six hundred dollars, so it, it's not used a lot. Um, local Improvement Fund. That's to improve with any, or to fund any local improvements, um, such as sidewalks. Um, I, it came up for discussion uh, just recently at council with putting um, some speed measures on oldest by Mount Road. If we were um, doing that as a local improvement, the money would have come out of this fund, and then we pay it back as we collect it back. Uh, that's it on those. And the Local Improvement Fund was, was basically established um, a number of years ago. Rather than um, if a community came, or a, a neighborhood came forward and wanted to put new sidewalks in, rather than the municipality borrowing money from the bank or borrowing from MFA, they established this fund so that we wouldn't have to go out and borrow money. We could just use the money from this fund and pay it back. So we're basically borrowing from ourselves or allowing residents to borrow from us and pay it back at a minimal uh, interest rate. Um, tap, sorry, I'll go on to the next one. Tax sale reserve fund. Tax sale reserve fund um, is funded uh, strictly from any monies that we collect from our annual tax sale. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of money in it. We don't have a lot of tax sales. Um, so, and it can only be used, so, so once you have money in this fund, this fund can only be used to purchase land and improvements. So it's not restricted to parkland. You can purchase any piece of land or improvements using this fund. Uh, sustainability Reserve Fund, this was established a couple of years ago when we signed on to the Climate Action Charter. And this is funded from um, the grants that we get through the Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program. And funds in these reserve funds can only be used for sustainability initiatives. 
And then we have the Eva Chafe Reserve Fund, which is, was established um, from funds from the estate and are, can only be used in maintaining the house that is on that property. So those are our reserve funds. Any other questions so far? And these are our reserve fund balances at January 1 of this year. So our machine and equipment reserve, we have two, you know, just shy of 2.5 million. Capital projects, just over 2.6 million. Local improvement, 123,000. Tax sale, 144. And you can see our parkland acquisition reserve fund, it was at a little over five, or close to 500,000, and we used a little over 400,000 for the purchase of that piece of property to add to Lampson Park. Um, Municipal Archives Trust Fund, 5,400. That, I don't, I think that's the same as it was eight years ago when I first came here, except for the $600 that we spent. Uh, there haven't been a lot of donations into it, and there haven't been a lot of funds expended from it. Um, Sustainability Reserve Fund, 84,000, and EVA Chafe, 38,000. So our reserve accounts, which are different than reserve funds. We have um, two reserve accounts. One is the casino fund. So um, these reserve accounts allow funds to be carried over from one fiscal year to the next. If we received this money into the municipality and we didn't put it in a reserve account, at the end of the year, any surplus funds simply go into an accumulated surplus account. They're not earmarked for anything. They're not specifically um, used for any projects. So what we do with the casino fund, because we have to account for it separately, we have to do annual reporting on gaming revenue. So we keep it in a separate reserve account, which means it's not as restrictive to be used and expended but it keeps it separate so we know exactly how much money we have in that account at any given time, and it doesn't go into general revenue. Question, Ms. Hurst. Um, the casino money, how long are we going to get that for? Is there a, a set time limit on that? As long as the casino is there. Okay, and right now it shows that it's going for the recreation revitalization. Right. It, was there a time limit put on that? Um, so right now, and not 100% of it goes to, goes to that. So I'll, I'll just um, um, go through that. So right now, you're right, $275,000 annually um, goes towards that revitalization. That revitalization happened in 2003, 2004. Um, that was a decision and a direction that was taken by the council of the day, was that um, that's how they were going to pay for the debt principal and interest payments on the debt. And I think the debt, and I'll get to that later, I, but I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I think it was around $7 million that we make uh, payments on uh, for that revitalization project. And so the council of the day decided we're gonna, we're gonna use casino uh, funds to pay for that. So that, that it was, I, I think it was a good decision at the time. It didn't result in a, in a tax increase at the time. And we've just continued to do that. Um, all along. We actually receive on an annual basis, um, well, we were receiving uh, around or just over $400,000 a year from casino funds, um, given the economic climate that has decreased uh, a little bit in, in the last year or two, down to anywhere between three hundred and fifty and 400000 So um, it still leaves a little bit outside of those debt payments uh, to be used. The um, philosophy that was used, um, and I can I can speak to this because I was in View Royal as the CFO when the casino was built, and um, almost all of the municipalities that signed on to the revenue sharing agreement don't bring that revenue into their general spending. They they use it for one-off projects. They use it for capital projects. Bringing that money into your general revenue and, and paying for your day-to-day -day operations on it is a, is, is a little, it's not a conservative finance decision that I would make. Um, it's money that you treat as additional money outside of your operations and you use it for 
um, one-time projects or projects with a definite term ending like these debt payments so that you know you don't become reliant on it as part of your operation so if it were taken away it wouldn't impact your day-to-day -day operation so that's the philosophy philosophy that's been used here it was the same philosophy that was used um, in view royal and it was the same philosophy that was used in soup when i was there thank you uh, I was actually on council at the time this came forward, and uh, I thought it was a good thing. Um, it is a percentage, and I forget what the percentage is, and that's why it varies. And I was also under the assumption that we were only going to use it for capital projects, uh, and I'm not sure if that's how it was written in, so that was sort of my thing, that it was only for capital projects and it wasn't for contingencies and such. Um. I don't know if that was the discussion at the time. It has been used, and all I can um, attest to is in the last eight years. We have used it for occasionally um, for non-capital items, but not items that were ongoing operational. Um, and because it's not, it's actually not in writing. It may have been part, that may have been part of the discussion, but because this is a reserve account, you don't have a bylaw that governs it, so you don't have anything in writing that says you can or cannot use it. And that's why I refer to it as being a philosophy or a direction that was given by council, but there's nothing in writing that says you have to spend it in this way. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, I think that's it for the casino fund. So our next reserve account is the Community Works Fund. And we talked a bit about this at council recently. Uh, this is uh, the fund that is administered through UBCM. We also have to report annually on this, and that's another reason for setting up reserve accounts. You don't restrict yourself by a bylaw, but you keep the money separate so that when we go to do audited financial statements and report out to the province on how we've spent this money, we have to report how much we received, we have to report how much we spent, we have to, in, in case of Community Works Fund, we have to actually list what projects we've spent it on through the year. So we are actually held very accountable for how this money is spent. Um, eligible projects, sorry, was there yeah, a question? Yeah, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, explain to our residents that the UBCM is the union that we see municipalities, and it is a collective, an association of municipalities, and they have taken on the role of helping to disseminate funds as one of the things that they do, and so we derive some benefit from that, and we are a member. So Community Works Fund, um, eligible projects uh, in this fund have to fall within very strict guidelines. Um, and we have to annually report out. And if UBCM doesn't agree that um, our project met the strict guidelines, they will not allow us to spend the money on that project. Uh, so Community Works Fund guidelines in in general, there's about there's four specific criteria that a project has to meet in order for you to be able to use this funding. And one of those guidelines is that it has to be an incremental project, in that it can't it has to increase something that you're doing. For instance, we've used it for the last couple of years for increasing the number of bus shelters that we have out in the community. Another uh, um, guideline that has to be met is, the, is that the outcomes must be measurable. So on this one, um, where when staff are, are trying to determine if a project fits within the guidelines, um, on a couple of our road projects, I think we did it on Esquimalt Road as well as Craig Flower Road, the portion of those projects that had to do with installing bike lanes could be funded through this fund. So we could bring some community works funding into those um, million dollar projects to pay for the bike lanes and then you can measure it, um, you can measure it and it's incremental and it, and, um, and I, I guess it's difficult to measure but we've been allowed to, to use that um, as one of our, our projects. Um, the, but for the money that is in the Community Works Fund. Here's, this is another guideline. The project that you use this money for has to be one that you wouldn't have done if you didn't have this money available to you. 
it has to be something that you wouldn't have done because it would have increased your tax rate or you it would have it would have received a less of a priority or the project wouldn't have been done if you didn't have this grant money sitting there to use another criteria has to be that it has to contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions or it has to result in cleaner air or cleaner water and it has to meet all four of those not just one of them it has to meet all four of those criteria in order for you to use this money so you'll see on the uh, 6th and 7th of March, we, um, I think we did a fairly good job this year of really going through all the budget requests and examining each and every one of them and figuring out if it met, if we could use uh, this funding. Because for a couple of years, we haven't used it because we didn't have projects that met all four of the criteria. Um, so we'll go through those in, in detail later, but it's, it's very restrictive. So here's our reserve account balances as at January 1st of this year. So casino revenue is 199,000. And we get that money um, throughout the year. So we don't, they don't send us the money at the beginning of the year. We haven't received our allocation uh, for 2012 yet. So that will go up by the amount of money that we get. And, and Mary, do we still get that on a quarterly basis? So we get a check quarterly um, on that money. So, or on that, in that fund. Community Works Funding, as you can see, we have a, a balance of over a million dollars in that fund right now. Keeping in mind that these balances don't incorporate any of the 2012 budget requests. And we'll, we'll go through how these balances will be affected when we talk about the details of the budget on the 6th and 7th, because we have made recommendations to council about use of these funds for certain projects that are in the budget. Um, okay, I apologize for this one being as small, the, the printing on it being as small as it is. This, I wanted to, um, to put this uh, information in front of you because this shows you how much total debt we have, debt payments we have as a municipality. So 2012, our total debt payments is one, just over $1.2 million. That's how much we pay in principal and interest for all the money that we've borrowed. So as you can see, the primary um, uh, principal and interest payments come, be, come from the rec center revitalization project and the sewer I&I, &I, sorry, I'm using acronyms again, the sewer infill and infiltra infiltration uh, program, which is the relining of our underground sewage uh, piping and the rec center revitalization project. We also have to, we have a, we belong to MFA, so the Municipal Finance Authority. I'm getting better at the, the acronyms. Municipal Finance Authority, that's where we borrow our money and that's um, because we get uh, collectively, all of the municipalities are able to borrow through, through them and get better interest rates than you would if you went out to the general banks. So when we want to purchase a piece of capital um, equipment or if we want to, um, as you can see here, there's a list of equipment that we've purchased through MFA. And what MFA does is they have what's called a capital lease program. So it's a, it's a way that you can borrow, or MFA will pay for your piece of equipment, and you sign a five-year lease and you pay back for the equipment over a five-year period, rather than expending your funds um, and doing that. It's a, it's a great program. I think the last time I checked, the interest rate on lease payments was 1.3%. Something, yeah. So it, it's it's a great program if you don't want to have a large impact on your budget. Um, so what impacts the budget is just the debt pay or just these debt payments rather than the total cost of the capital, and you can space it out over five years so that you don't get those spikes in your in your tax tax rates. Um, we also have some short term debt that we used when we did the Admiral's Colville intersection, and short term debt is five years or less. And debt that we, um, uh, funds that we borrow and pay back within five years, you don't have to go out to um, the public or to the residents and get permission to borrow. If you wanted to borrow money for longer than five years, you have to get elector assent, which means you have to go out to a referendum or you have to do an alternative approval process. That was done for both the rec center um, project 
and the sewer project. So your residents have to agree that they're willing to pay the bill for the money that you're going to borrow if it takes longer than five years to pay it back. So right now, and you'll see this, there's a number at the bottom of this spreadsheet. It's called the liability servicing. Liability, oh sorry. To just so what was the years of those, those, approved, those two approvals? I'm just trying to figure out where we are in relation to it. Um, I, next slide coming up will tell you when it matures. So oh, okay. We'll still get into that. Um, uh, so, where is, oh, liability servicing capacity. So that is a number that is recalculated every year. It's actually calculated as part of our audited financial statements. So the number that I have here for 2011, we, we had a, a, an approved number for 2010. We wanted to update that, so this is an approximate number. But that $5.3 million, what that symbolizes is how much more in debt payments we would be allowed to incur by the province, by the inspectors and municipalities doesn't mean that you can borrow 5.3 million, it means that you can borrow money that results in debt payments of 5.3 million dollars and still be what the province considers to be is solvent enough to make those debt payments. Um, and the liability servicing capacity uh, calculation is based on how much tax revenue you collect each year, it, and it's a formula, it's a big long formula, but it includes um, how much tax revenue you receive or able to collect each year, how, how much value you have in your capital assets, um, and it, it really just is like going uh, to the bank on a, on a personal level and the bank approving you and, and, and saying that you have enough solvency to incur this much debt payment. So we are very healthy when it comes to debt. We have very, compared to a lot of other municipalities, we have very low debt payments for this municipality. questions on that before we go on? So the next slide shows when all of our debt. Now this one, different than the first one showed what we're making in payments, this shows what we actually borrowed. So um, you can see the sewer uh, infil infiltration program, $6.75 million. That, these were done, so we'll have to, we'll have to count backwards, but they were done this project was done incrementally. We borrowed the money. We got the bylaw to borrow the money. We got elector assent, but we borrowed the money gradually up to 6.75 over a number of years, over four years, as we did the work. We, and we didn't want to incur the interest payments until we'd actually done the work and incurred the cost. Um, and so when you get a borrowing bylaw approved by the province and by the inspector of municipalities, you have five years to draw on that bylaw before it's basically considered stale dated. So um, these all mature in 2000, or 2024, 25, 26, and 27. So the, and these are 15 year borrowings. It's normal when you're doing borrowings of this amount to either go with 15 or 20 years. Uh, the revitalization project, that was for the rec center of 6.8 million. And here, you, this uh, short-term borrowing matures in 2015 for Colville. And the Grafton Area Pilot Project matures in this year. So that debt payment falls off this year. And I think if I look back to Grafton Area, that debt payment, um, I don't think we have it separated out on there. Anyways, that's a debt payment. So what would happen if you remember, recall earlier, so once that debt payment is finished, I think, I don't know if it gets finished part, it probably gets finished part way through the year. What we would do for the 2013 budget is we would take that $425 instead of making a debt payment, we would take the 425 and put it in the capital projects reserve fund. So that's how that works. And same with the, with the um, and well, sorry, it's not 425,000, we borrowed 425, it's whatever the debt payments were on that will go into the capital projects reserve fund. And that'll be the same um, for any other debt that matures. Any questions on that? Okay, so 
Is everybody still awake? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm almost done. So this is um, a slide that I put in because th we did this a couple of years ago. And it was really in response of those of you who are well, here remember we did it on a, on a Saturday and it was a, a sort of a workshop on, you know, where are we at, what service levels do we provide, why are our tax rates, um, well, we frequently hear that our tax rates are higher in comparison to other municipalities in the, in the regional district. And there are a couple of reasons for that and this is one of them. Um, we did a basic, this and this is, there wasn't a lot of science put into this, it's a basic service level comparison. Um, you can look at some of the other municipalities, they share recreation facilities, they share policing in that they all, like for instance West Shore has, I don't know, is it three or four municipalities that are policed out of that, so they have, whereas ourselves, Oak Bay, Saanich, and Victoria all provide our own standalone, self-sufficient um, level of service. Um, that's a conscious decision by council. If you wanted to change that, you could give that direction, but this has been a conscious decision, um, and we wanted to really look at look at that a couple of years ago, and that's where this information came from. Councilor Hodgins? What might be helpful next time you look at this uh, particular matrix, this chart, would be to give us the population mm -hmm. for the various communities. It just, I think it would add value. I think we actually um, have that slide, and I didn't include it here, but we have one that actually has the, um, and so it's a, a little outdated, it's, it, we did this a couple years ago, but we did a chart that actually had the population and the cost of each of these services on it. So we can, I think we can dig that one up, Mary, and we that can just- That would be very helpful. Here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, going back to your earlier statement that this was in response to the frequently uh, heard uh, claim that Squamalt's uh, tax rates are amongst the highest, and of course this chart explains that we do do a lot of services on our own. And the other communities that, according to the chart, are Squamalt, Oak Bay, Saanich, Victoria, that pretty much across the board do many of their own services. So would it be more fair and accurate to compare our tax rates with those other few municipalities as opposed to all the CRD municipalities? And then and that, I guess where I'm leading to is how do we compare with those four municipalities, uh, Oak Bay, Saanich, and Victoria? So, so here's the other complicating factor. Mm -hmm. So we can't just strictly take tax rates for each, from each of those municipalities and compare them. Because in order to be ca comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, you have to know what they include in that operating fund upon which the tax rate is based. A lot of municipalities, including uh, Victoria, I know for one, I don't know about the other ones, but Victoria bills separately for utilities. We don't. Victoria bills separately for sewer, for water. We don't, we don't bill for those separately. Those are all included in our municipal tax rate. So in order to bring all of those down to the common denominator, you would basically have to examine their budgets as well and take out everything that is not similar in each of the tax rates. And so it's not, I, I'm not saying that it can't be done, it's not as simple as just comparing the tax rates. For instance, we don't separate out garbage charges, we don't separate out sewer charges. Those are all part of our municipal function and they're all make up part of our tax rate. And we, we have gone to a, as part of this workshop, we also, I have some information on that that I can give to you, where we did make an attempt to do that comparison, and I can give you that, that slide as well. I'm, I'm just wondering then if there's ever been a push um, across the region, sorry, through the chair, to, uh, across the region, with, with all the CRD municipalities to have one uniform system for uh, preparing their tax notices and uh, you know, uh, categorizing their, their various aspects of their tax notice. Um, I think for us it would be very difficult. And I say that because uh, we're in a very unique situation with our D&D &D PILT. Right, yeah. Because they pay a PILT based on the tax rates. They do not pay utilities, they do not pay those extra charges. So you would, if you were to go to a, um, a con 
consistent uh, format amongst all the municipalities, you would have to take that into consideration because that would have an alternate, an opposite proportionate effect on the PILT. We're all too different. We're all, we're a little different. Yeah. I don't think we're all that different. I think the majority of the other municipalities actually separate out the utilities. We're one of the very few that doesn't. So we're not all that different, but we are the only municipality that has a third of our taxes coming from a federal park property that doesn't pay taxes normally. So are we unique as amongst all 13? Yes, we are. Because Colwood is probably the only other one that's comparable. As far as, I, don't, I still don't think that, I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I, I don't think that their, the pilt that they receive is quite as uh, a significant portion of their revenue as ours is, but they're, but, but they're probably closer than any of the other municipalities to our situation. But yeah, we are, we are in, a, in a bit of a unique situation. Thank you. Councilor Hundleby. Thank you, I have two comments. One of them is that this issue actually came up in one of our tax forums that we had earlier this year with the mayor. And it was really quite revealing in that if we took out of our taxes, our utilities and fire and policing, which the D&D property built doesn't pay for, they would be paying less and we would be paying more. So it helps us actually for the uh, pill to be based on everything so that it helps reduce for the rest of the taxpayers Absolutely. the amount. And I, and I think that's a really important piece that a lot of the residents at, at, at the forum did not realize right. and all of a sudden they went, oh, well that's gonna be a good thing we don't separate it out. And the other thing I wanted to share was uh, I've been uh, involved in the last few weeks with uh, CRD budgets. And what I didn't realize about the CRD is that they provide services to a lot of the different programs. So I was quite surprised to see things like the Panorama Rec Center and West Shore Recreation and everything on the CRD budget lines because they kind of act as the administrator for that. So they would charge their, their bid as well. So whereas we do our own administration. So uh, it, it is really quite difficult to try and do some of those apples to apples things. I didn't realize to what extent it was. So it's revealing. And, and also utilities. Utilities are all different too, even with the four cores. I just thought I'd share that. Councillor Hodgins. Uh, through the chair, just curious in terms of, uh, I don't see Souk, is, is that, uh, is that back a few years ago when maybe there wasn't an opportunity to compare or? I'm not sure why we didn't have Sukhum. Okay. Just curious. I don't think there's any reason, to be quite honest. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're Okay. I am getting to the end. I have two more slides. <laughs> this this just I we I found it, I've been giving budget presentations for um, God, I don't even want to say this close to 20 years. It really helps to do all of this familiarization with how it works before we actually put the numbers in front of you because it saves a lot of confusion and questions. So um, bear with me. So here um, in preparation for looking at the five-year plan, we have to make certain, certain assumptions when we're putting it together. These are just factors and assumptions that we've made in putting that five-year plan together. So for, uh, obviously for the current budget year, it's based on what we actually know or have good knowledge is going to happen. Years two through, five, two through five are a little more difficult. So what we do is we just, we increase revenues by, um, so their revenues are 101%, expenditures at 102%. That's the conservative accounting way of doing it so that we aren't in a bad position. Um, pay increases at 2%. Um, fire department pay increases at 3%. Um, and the other assumptions that we make in putting uh, it together, or putting the five-year plan together is that we get a return um, our, on our, all of our investments of 1.5%. 
and that all transfers between funds happen at the end of the year, not at the beginning of the year. And that probably doesn't mean much to you right now, but it will once we get into um, the details later. Thank you. Thank you to Ms. Hurst. I hadn't realized that the fire department was, hey, was based on 103%, and I wondered about why that was, and also what have we done for policing over the time? Um, policing will be considered to be an expenditure and is increased by the 2% until we know anything different. Um, and, and the chief can speak to this, but fire departments and police departments um, historically and pretty consistently get a, a, a slightly higher pay and wage increases than QB. So that's why they would be at 3% rather than the 2%. Perhaps because of things like danger pay and shift work. Yeah, it's just historically that's the way it's been. Um, last slide. So what you're going to um, have for the rest of the evening is each of the departments is going to give you an overview of their core budgets. They're going to tell you what level of service they provide under their, those core budgets and maybe a few extra things. Um, but what we did just on a, a, a sort of um, general basis is we took the 2011 core budgets versus 2012 and came up with just a bottom line difference between the two. And um, we've gone through, and as you can see, 90% of it is built in wage increases. Your core budget really, the increases are attributable to um, collective agreement wage increases for the most part. But we just wanted to, if I, if I take, um, the factors, it doesn't totally add up to the $849,000, but that's the majority of the increases. So I, I just do that out of my own, for my own information to see what's in those core budgets. But like I said, as you can see, it's, it's basically utilities and, and collective agreement wages. Councillor Morrison? And just to zero in on the, the management and exempt wages, they're automatically tied to the, to the collective agreement wages. So if up 2% all management and exempt staff get a 2% increase automatically? Um, it, there's a little twist on that. Okay. Um, but for the most part, you're right. We have a, a, a council policy in place that basically says that every three years we're going to do a market analysis. So we're going to go out there and, and compare our exempt staff, wa staff uh, wages to other municipalities, to a, a, a group of municipalities that are similar. Um, but those, but in the in between years, between those three year market analysis, yes, it's equivalent to QB. So every three years we do, a, we do an analysis to make sure that we're, we're in line with other municipalities, that we're competitive on our exempt salaries. And then um, in years, in the two years in between, uh, exempt staff would get what QB gets. So in those off years, um, sorry, through the chair, the, 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 the ones that are not, they're based on comparison, not based on the collective agreement uh, changes. Are they discretionary, or are they built into all the contracts of our management? Not built in. It comes to council for approval. Oh, okay. Yes. The whole market analysis comes to council for discussion and approval. So it's not built into anybody's uh, contracts so or into a bylaw. So they're only, re I guess, they're only automatic when there's a collective agreement change. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, see you to Ms. Hurst. When I was on the Greater Victoria Library Board, it, I was and on the finance something. Uh, we were advised that for staff, the the benefits for the I think it was pension, uh, they were they were told that it was increased, and so all the benefits then had to be increased for staff, and we had to build it into. Um, the budget and that is the case here as well is it not yeah a lot of our, our benefit package is based on salary so there is is not necessarily a directly proportionate increase but there usually is some increase on the benefit side when the weight is increased
starting off with corporate services. So uh, uh, firstly, I'm going to just review the uh, uh, core services provided by the corporate services department and then review the existing staffing in that department. Um, then I'll look at strategic priorities applicable to the department and lastly review um, challenges for the 2012 budget. So starting with the first one, there are uh, 11 core services provided by the Corporate Services Department and uh, I've itemized these uh, just very briefly. Uh, the first one is really uh, administration and this comes from the Community Charter Section 147 which is really the CAO functions. Um, overall management of operations, implementation of council policies, all of those things, um, advisor to council and ensure compliance with uh, the strategic plan and financial plan. So that's oversight of the administration of the rest of the municipality that comes from, through corporate services. Uh, legislative function comes again from the um, Community Charter Section 148, and this is really uh, my role as a corporate officer. Um, and this is to make sure that all of the processes and procedures in, uh, in councils functioning uh, comply with the legislation. So that includes all the issuing of the various notices, agendas, minutes, bylaws um, that council does to conduct its business. Um, the uh, corporate services um, officer or the corporate officer is responsible for the municipal records as well, which is preparation, maintenance, and secure retention of those records as well as public access to records. Um, ensuring compliance with the applicable um, legislation, bylaws, and policies. Next slide, uh, two more fu core functions here. Uh, one is sustainability. We have a sustainability coordinator and that um, is part of the corporate services department. Uh, this is management of the township's climate action charter commitments, which include the sustainability reserve fund that we heard about, as well as development of uh, plans and policies and promotion of uh, sustainability initiatives within, within both the corporate um, structure itself and in the community as well. Uh, communications is another function that uh, we perform in corporate services and this is our communications coordinator um, to ensure um, consistent messaging to internal and exter external stakeholders through a variety of media channels. Coordin coordinating the development and production of web and print communications material for township initiatives. Uh, Councillor so just under communications, would that mean that uh, corporate services is responsible for all paid advertising in the municipality? I know some of it is required under the community charter with public hearings and notices, but other, others would be discretionary. Um, no, I think that each department uh, does its own. Did you want to? Yeah, okay. so um, so Parks and Recreation does a lot of, uh, or does most of their own. I think Richie gets involved in some of it. Communications corner and gets involved in some of it. Some of it, development services does all their own uh, advertising for public hearings and those sorts of things. The communications coordinator is much more uh, of corporate messaging, not specifically to development functions or parks and rec functions. So general general maintenance of the website would be through this uh, uh, function as well as um, uh, media releases for the corporation. Um, okay, the uh, next one is archives. Uh, this is the preservation and interpretation of historical records, uh, promotion of the, our heritage and uh, conducting research as well. So archives does actually retain um, the corporate records uh, physically, uh, some of it in their uh, facility. Um, elections. The corporate services staff um, are appointed as the um, chief election officer and the uh, deputy chief election officer. So we uh, uh, do all the uh, municipal elections, by-elections, other voting opportunities that we've heard about. This could be binding or non-binding referendum and the alternative approval process where that's required that would be conducted through um, our staff as well. Human resources is part of the department as well, which uh, obviously takes care of recruitment and selection of employees and uh, deals with uh, labor relations, employee relations, occupational health and safety, and uh, collective agreements, training and development, and makes uh, compensation um, uh, recommendations to council. 
Next, we have bylaw enforcement, which is fairly new to the Corporate Services Department. Um, and the bylaw enforcement officer in this department would make sure that there is compliance, or try to make sure that there is compliance with municipal uh, regulatory bylaws. Uh, we review and develop uh, policies and regulations. Uh, complaint management, there are a lot of complaints from the neighbors, uh, neighborhood about uh, various uh, things that we have to check into and investigate. Uh, public education and awareness is a large part of what we try to do to try to encourage voluntary compliance uh, with our uh, regulations as much as possible. Then there's administrative assistance. Uh, we have uh, several staff that provide assistance to mayor, council, the CAO, to all of the various committees um, and boards that uh, are in existence, as well as to other staff and other departments on an as-needed basis, um, mostly relating to researching of uh, municipal records and, and past practices and policies. And customer service, of course, so you have a front-line uh, staff that deal with uh, assistance to uh, members of the public on an as-needed basis. Then one of the core services that takes up quite a bit of uh, time for uh, the department uh, is the committees. The communications coordinator is the staff liaison for the Centennial Celebration Select Committee and also is acting as the project manager and uh, uh, promoting the uh, celebrations. Sustainability Coordinator is the staff liaison for the Environmental Advisory Committee. So in addition to the staff liaison, there is also, um, the next slide, the, there is also administrative support staff that have been assigned to uh, numerous committees to act as recording secretary. And the list is there, you can see quite a few um, existing committees. So each one of these committees would really um, have two staff allocated. One was a staff resource um, to ensure that um, uh, the agenda matters are um, and information is provided to the uh, committee members and that uh, reports and memos and minutes from the um, committees go up to um, council for approval and for their information. And then the recording sec secretary would make sure that the uh, notices and agendas and minutes get actually done. And, and um, put into our corporate records. Uh, the next slide then summarizes the staffing that we currently have, and uh, you can see it's uh, equivalent to 9.4 FTEs, full-time equivalents, and they are uh, listed there. So, of course, it's the um, chief administrative officer who also acts as a deputy corporate officer. We have the manager of human resources and myself, uh, manager of corporate services, who acts as the corporate officer, uh, the head and coordinator under Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, as well as the chief election officer. Uh, then we have a sustainability coordinator, a full-time position. And uh, then we have the, some part-time staff. Uh, communications coordinator is currently a 0.6 uh, position. The bylaw enforcement officer is also a 0.6 position. Then we have uh, executive secretary to the mayor and the CAO, an office administrator, and a confidential recording secretary who um, acts in that capacity to counsel, committee of the whole, and the Esquimalt Policing and Law Enforcement Advisory Panel. Um, archivist is a 0.8 position and a receptionist who is a 0.4 position. And that makes up staffing in the corporate services department. Um, I just wanted to um, point out some of the strategic priorities that uh, have just come out of the recent workshops that are applicable to the CAO and to the Corporate Services Department. Um, these are itemized here to the future le legacy. Um, these were all in the um, work plan, the strategic priorities chart that was distributed a while ago, and these are taken from that. Um, the future legacy um, issue, the policing, the RFP process, the policing transition as well, um, and the service capacity to review. Those four items are specifically with the CAO. Then we get it, oh, as, as well as a performance management system. So those, those are the uh, ones applicable to the CAO. The next ones are for the Corporate Services Department, in particular bylaw enforcement, uh, review of policies and practices, as well as bylaw review looking at specific uh, bylaws uh, targeted. Um, uh, there's records management system updates and uh, the policy review program itself. Uh, climate action plans, there are several um, 
targets and uh, actions and policies and implementation of programs and commitments that are um, identified in the strategic priorities. Website refreshment was um, uh, specifically identified as well as enhanced public engagement. Councillor Hundleby. Thank you, uh, to the Chair, to Ms. Nervo. Um, it was regarding the bylaw enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. So I understood that there was, um, that this position has moved over from development services. And so is this bylaw enforcement officer at point six to do with things like building inspections or is this strictly bylaws without any other duty? I, I guess a few of us can answer that. Up until now, the point six has been a mixture of both. Um, the, this specifically, point six, has been mostly focused on bylaw, but there's been some backfilling for the building inspector um, when he's not there. So there is some cross training there. And, and Barb's been um, having those two positions reporting to her for, or up until this January, so for, for all the years that I've been here, so she can speak to that. More, more than I can. Yeah, up until recently, up until up until January first, um, by law enforcement, the function rested with development services. It's been switched over to corporate services at the start of this year, and we're in a transition period right now, figuring out exactly whether this point six person um, is going to be, is going to be focusing solely on by law enforcement, or whether they will still have to continue to do a little bit of backfilling in by law enforcement as necessary. So as you're probably aware, there was a situation this past fall where our, our building inspector was absent for several months. And so that really uh, took our, this person, the point six person, it took a lot of their time away from bylaw because we absolutely had to have somebody doing building inspection. So we're hoping, um, you know, we're working through this, but what we're hoping to do is by splitting the two functions, we can focus more efficiently on bylaw enforcement. Thank you. So if I could then just clarify, so building inspection still resides with development services? No, that's been put into engineering. Okay, and then is there any shared services then? Are we sharing that person with, with anyone else? With um, either First Nations or Vieux Royal like we had in the past? The building inspector um, does occasionally do First Nations inspections. Those are very infrequent. Uh, it doesn't take up a lot of staff time. And there is uh, not a shared agreement with View Royal, but it sometimes causes confusion because the 0.6 person that we have working for us, when the, the days that he's not working here, he has a separate agreement that he works with View Royal, but it's two separate agreements. It's not a shared arrangement between the municipalities. Thank you for that. Any more questions on the strategic priorities? Then the last slide is just uh, pointing out some challenges to the 2012 budget. Uh, these include the, uh, the bylaw enforcement workload um, exceeds the capacity. I think we're currently at 152 bylaw complaints that, um, that we're trying to work through and they keep coming in on a daily basis. So that is uh, definitely um, uh, an issue. Um, strategic plan priorities for public communications will also impact capacity. There's um, a council direction to try to um, uh, enhance public communication and we have a 0.6 uh, person that uh, is charged with all of the communications for the organization. Um, sustainability initiatives that were not completed in 2011 are carried forward as well. Um, and the 2011 core budget was reduced while trying to attempt uh, to maintain and, and improve service levels. So that reduction in the core um, is going to impact um, the ability to, to do core services this, this year again. And uh, in 2011, there was also uh, delayed purchases of uh, equipment and additional filing cabinets in particular. And we postponed a records management project and uh, it's getting um, to the point that it's quite crucial to address these in uh, 2012 before we get uh, too far behind in our records management. And that's my presentation. Any further questions from Council? Uh, Councillor Hunnaby. Thank you. I'll answer you to Ms. Nervo. So in order to address some of the um, capacity issues, especially around the records management, does that mean you will be looking for some sort of auxiliary personnel to help with doing that, or how will you manage that in terms of resources? 
we will be addressing that those requests for resourcing on the 6th and 7th of March. That makes up some of our supplemental requests that council will be going through on an item by item basis. So Thank we're you. trying to address those capacity re uh, requirements. Do we have timelines that we have to fulfill? I don't think we have specific deadlines that we have to meet in order. Uh, there's no legislative requirements that are going to be missed. There's no deadlines that are going to be missed um, for that. Thank you. <coughs> it's your turn. Do you, I don't think this reaches all the way down there. Do you want to sit here? Just, just stand here. No, I'll, I'll stand. You can. Oh. Do you have your presentation with you? Do you want to know? I'll just. Okay. I'll stand behind you. Oh, nervous. <laughs> Thanks. The next presentation is on the fi financial and IT services. Uh, for finance, it's uh, uh, stated in the community charter, section 149, that it is responsible for the over ma overall management of the financial affairs of the township. And this includes um, the receiving and uh, expanding and investing of all monies received. Uh, and authorized by council, and we also have to ensure that the uh, keeping of all funds and securities, and also we have to um, ensure that there is accurate and full reporting of the financial affairs, and that they will be kept um, set, safe, maintained, and prepared. Um, some of the highlights and, uh, for 2011 for finance is um, we were responsible for the counting and statutory reporting audit and budgeting um, of $33.3 million in annual expenses and revenues. Um, there's cash management of up to $23 million in investments on a daily basis. And what we try to do is maximize uh, the returns um, to, uh, I guess, give us more interest. Uh, payroll coordinated the production of three different payroll groups. Uh, we have QP, the fire, and the exempt. And um, it's paid on a bi-weekly basis. And uh, payroll also uh, maintains benefits for uh, about 135 staff, and we issued 349 T4 slips in 2011. Uh, accounts payable, we um, do a weekly uh, pay run, uh, check run, and in 2011 we processed about 4,000 checks and just over 7,000 um, purchasing transactions. Property taxes, we uh, produced almost 5,000 tax notices. Um, just a little over 300 tax deferment applications, um, 3,700 homeowner grants, 400, um, just over 400 property tax certificates, and we have a tax installment program where we actually collected over $795,000. And licensing issued um, just over 800 dog licenses and six, um, 650 business licenses. The finance team consists of eight full-time positions which is made up of a director and deputy director of financial services, a senior accountant, two pl uh, clerk three positions, one payroll and one accounting, uh, two clerk two positions, um, which uh, does payroll, licensing, and accounting and finance clerk one. Uh, the next um, core service is on the IT or information technology department and they are responsible for the overall management of the database systems, telecommunications, hardware and software, um, and the securities, uh, system securities, and, and they have um, six locations that they're um, supporting, and they also operate um, a help desk to, um, um, for, for staff queries. Uh, they conduct and organize technology training courses, assess new products and applications, and they maintain and upgrade the existing corporate technology infrastructure and applications. Some of the uh, uh, things that they do and they support is uh, they provide uh, daily help desk to over 222 users. Um, they have 24 servers which have um, 60 um, distinct services. They have over 70 pieces of end user software over four terabytes of da data. I don't know if everybody understands that, because I don't. 150 computers they're supporting, 25 laptops, 50 wide thin terminals. Um, they have also 50 printers and multi-function devices, 100 mobile and smartphones, 15 wireless access, access points, three websites, and, we, and they also provide support to remote access services, 45 network switches, four firewalls, 
Um, they have a multi-site corporate telephone uh, system. Uh, they also have to support a building access control system. And for the rec center, the HVAC, DDC network, server and web services. Their team consists of two full-time positions, which is made up of a manager and uh, information technology coordinator. Uh, some of the challenges for, to maintain the core service levels for finance and IT is that the IT workload um, exceeds capacity and resources, as you can see from uh, the slide, previous slide. And we have a technology requirement where we have a, uh, basically uh, an obsolete payroll uh, software program. Um, it's no longer um, being uh, sold, but uh, and they just give us our basic enhancements, such as your tax tables. Um, but we do need a better um, uh, payroll software system in order to meet our payroll and human, human resources. Council, any questions? Uh, Councilor Hodgins. Through the chair, so just in terms of the IT enhancements that are necessary, has some money been put into the reserves for that purpose? Yes, as Lori has indicated in the machinery equipment reserve fund, there, there is a, uh, an amount that is allotted for um, IT, and um, you'll see that when we um, look through or go through the capital and supplemental. Thank you. Councillor Rondovi. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you to uh, Ms. Turner, I wonder if you would just comment on the legislative requirements that a municipality must follow and relate that to the number of positions we have in, in the finance department, in terms of the services team, financial services team, and also then related to our business functions, our administration and, and business, just because we are a business. Um, that, well, is that too much to ask? Well, legislatively, we, we, we fall under the community charter, but we also have um, legislative reporting, statutory reporting requirements um, such as uh, we have um, for the provincial government at the end of the year we have to file an annual report. We also have a statement of financial information. Um, there's also a year-end uh, uh, financial process where we have to complete a year-end, but it also has to be audited and it has to be, the, and all the f findings and the reports must be pre presented to council. Um, there's uh, I guess I just repeat, is, is, is that answer all the question, or have I missed something? Well, I, I was interested in the legislative part, but also then in terms of the business functions. I mean, it, eight people seems like a lot, but I know that you have to roll out a lot of information too, so I just wanted to just sort, of sort it out a little bit so that we understand it better. I just wanted to add to um, the legislative requirements. So we have to do audited financial statements. Those have to be into the province by May 15th, or, or by uh, June 30th of every year. Um, we also have to audit the community works monies and report on that. We have to audit the gaming revenue and report on that. We have to do what's called a SOFI report, which is a statement of financial information under the Financial Information Act. Um, that's basically, we have, to, we have to do a balanced budget every year. Um, we have to, what other things do we have to do? So in terms of the staffing, in terms of the reporting requirements, you, you look at all the reports that have to be done, the audit, the, the two uh, reserve accounts, the um, statement of financial information, that's all done at the same time the budget's being done. So from January to June of each year, so our, our budget, as you know, has to be done on or before, or has to be done before May 15th, adopted by council before May 15th. So from, you, you can't start doing your year end until January you have to, at the same time, have started working on your budget in usually September, October. Your department heads start working on it because it has to be adopted by May 15th. Your financial statements have to be into the province by June 30th. So in that time frame, that's where um, you've got at least, and right now we're short one position in the finance department. So I'll be assisting with that a bit this year. So from January till June, you've got probably at least four of those people dedicated to budget year-end financial reporting. Um, but to go through the department, you've got, it, it, it may sound like a lot of people when you have it on there. Um, the person at the front desk, the one person at the front desk 
handles every single phone call coming into the municipality. She operates the main reception area and operates the front desk and the front cash register for receiving all those payments on permits, dog licenses, tax payments, all the rest of that. She's the frontline person, so that's one of your staff members. Um, two of the other staff members, you saw how many um, payments, so like 7,000 transactions for uh, payables. Well, that includes <coughs> matching up the purchase orders that the departments uh, put in, uh, ensuring that the proper authorization is on those um, purchase orders. Uh, when the invoicing comes in, matching those up, making sure the payments get out on time. We do payables runs every week to make sure that we don't incur late payment charges and that none of our accounts are outstanding. So you've got basically two people that operate that. Um, you've got a, a senior accountant who then, um, she's one of the ones that is working on budget and year end and uh, capital projects, especially now with the um, uh, depreciation requirements that we have. Huge project. We started three years ago. Um, we started three years ago because we had to start reporting last year. It took two years of work to do it. We had to do an inventory of the entire municipality, including trees, um, uh, sewer lines, uh, telephone poles, street lights, all of that. And now we have to account for that every year. That in itself is probably a quarter of a person, a 0.25 FTE, just to do all of our depreciation and to keep track of our assets and to record all of that. Um, you then have two payroll people. One person is senior payroll person. She does payroll for all three um, employee classes, so QP, uh, IAFF, and exempt, including um, monthly remittances for ben and collection of benefits and administering all the benefit programs. The second uh, junior payroll person is split between payroll, she, she does all the auxiliary and regular part-time employees, which we have quite, I don't know, how many do we have in your department, Scott? At, at any given time, on, on average over the year, 100? Um, so she does a bi-weekly payroll for those people, in addition to business licenses and dog licenses. So she does all of that. Um, the deputy director is responsible for reviewing all of that work that's done by all of those other people, issuing um, um, the bank statements, doing bank reconciliations on a monthly basis. Um, and then the, de the director of finance, we don't have one right now, but that um, person generally is the one that basically is in charge of the department and managing that everything gets done and whatever strategic priorities council has. We're up to the Engineering and Public Works uh, Division. So there's two departments within that division. And the mandate for both of them is the maintenance, the upgrading, the development of our municipal infrastructure in both a cost-effective and sustainable ma manner. Uh, we'll start with engineering. And they get into capital projects that can range from the Alamo Road uh, study to the Craig Flower Road upgrade to deconstruction just next door. They also look at our infrastructure maintenance planning, uh, maintaining our recorded information on the infrastructure system. So that's our roads, our sewers, our manholes, all that. Uh, they also have a, take a role in looking at the new developments and <laughs> Uh, coming over to us this year is now the building permit side. So that's a new function, but it, it's one that we're familiar with as engineering again comments on this as they go along. Public works on the other hand gets to maintain everything that engineering builds as it comes over. So they will do the operation of the existing infrastructure. So our, wa not our water, uh, storm and sanitary lines, roads and such, street lights. Um, and that also includes the maintenance of it. 
They are also taking on a new role uh, where they're starting to construct new portions of our system. So for thus, the one most commonly known would be the sidewalk uh, capital program. And throughout, to meet this mandate, um, engineering and public works in different degrees touch every one of these uh, areas. Uh, I don't think I'm going to run through every one of them because I think most people are familiar with what we do touch. Um, but it is, if basically if it gets you in the municipality someplace or it takes something away from your place, um, we have a hand in it somehow. Uh, yes, we do actually. OH&S requirement. So who does all this? Uh, we have a director that's split basically between the two, de two departments. We have engineering that has a manager and three technologists, our building official, and we have an office administrator that we share with development. Um, public works, we're, so that's a total of six FTEs. On the public works side, we have a manager, a supervisor, uh, our labor pool that ranges from our laborers, our operators, and they cover all our operations from solid waste, utilities, street operations. We have three facility maintenance individuals that look at very par various parts of our facilities and our parks. We have two mechanics, a uh, stores keeper, and that all totals up to be 22.5. And our challenge is maintaining an aging infrastructure. Uh, you might have heard the uh, term infrastructure gap, and that's one of the favorites in my part of the world. And basically, it's a good way to say, I need money to fix what we have. Um, our challenge is, at this time, because of where we're at, we're more reactive to uh, a situation than we are proactive. So. And that's kind of reflected in some of the examples I've thrown down there. Our budget at this time is only for 2,000 square meters of asphalt replacement. So in a given year, we can replace 2,000 square meters uh, of asphalt and 235 meters of sidewalk. Uh, that's a little down from where we were in 2009, but we're, we're coming up. But in order to, what we're recognizing or I'm working towards is if we can get some asset management of our infrastructure in place and creating these asset management plans, we can start scheduling our maintenance so we can do small fixes today that will prevent something later on. So in some ways, if you go out to a road and fix a pothole or where it's allegating or cracking very badly. If you fix that today, you can extend the life of the road maybe another 10 or 15 years because the water's not getting into the base. If you don't, uh, by the time you get to the next 10 years, that base might have destroyed itself and then you have to rebuild the entire road. So if we can get to a point where we're more proactive, where we're correcting these little things ahead of time, that will extend the life of our facilities. And you have to remember a lot of our facilities are now coming, I think the youngest one without any improvements we've done is at least 60 years old. And some of them are, are getting up around the 100 year mark. So we're an old community and we're starting to show our age somewhat, but gracefully. <laughs> and with that, any questions? Um, just wondering if we could talk about the garbage collection for a moment. And we noticed our neighbor Victoria having quite a debate over um, the extent of a, a pickup service. Uh, and from what I, as an observer of the debate, it seems like part of the discussion from their council and from their, from their uh, administration is that there could be significant cost savings by changing the level of service, uh, the, the approach to the pickup service. So 
So I'm wondering if that's something your department's also looking at, and if there's been any established savings there at all. That will be a report that's going to be coming back to council, I'm thinking in March or April, as my schedule allows. There will be some cost savings. Um, what they would be, I'm not too sure. With us, we're also looking at the fact that going on to private par property is somewhat putting our workers at risk um, as opposed to working on municipal property. So that's another aspect we have to examine. So your that report that you mentioned, that would be considered as part of the 2012 budget? That would have an impact on your bottom line? By the time we implement it, it would probably be in moving into the 2013 budget. Okay. It's not something I could flip a switch and all of a sudden it happens. Um, there would be equipment that we are looking at purchasing that will play into it, uh, depending on what option council would chooses. Uh, there would be some lead time to get started up. So. More likely than not, you would see it in the 2013 budget, any impacts or savings on, at that time. So the City of Victoria having their debate right now for their upcoming budget, we'll probably have a similar debate for our later budget, the uh, 2013 budget. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hodgins and then Hundley. Uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Miller, in terms of uh, building inspections, you have uh, under engineering, building official. You have the one position that is responsible then for? Yes, we only have one building official. Okay. Councilor Hundley. Thank you. So uh, I'm expecting then that your report, um, Mr. Miller, uh, will include uh, something about trucks. And I also wondered, uh, being as we were talking about it at CRD today about the collection of kitchen scraps. So is Esquimalt also looking at the possibility of collecting kitchen scraps to reduce uh, what going, what's going to the heart of landfill? Uh, yes, we are. That would probably form a portion of that report that's coming forward because it will change um, how we do work or and such. So how that's going to change it, I haven't fully explored it yet, but the CRD is as far as I know, still planning to go ahead with an organic span in 2013, at which case as we as a user uh, would have to find some way of dealing with our organics or possibly facing fines as we go across the scale there. So it is part of what I have to look at and come back to council with. Thank you. And I wondered if you might just touch on the idea of the annual cleanup. So in past years, long past years, um, there used to be a truck from the municipality that would go around and pick up things that were difficult for people to dispose of. Uh, and uh, that stopped because of cost. Now, I know that uh, there are some people who still come to me and say, you know, it would be really nice to have an annual cleanup. Uh, it would be good, I think, if you could, um, if you could uh, provide a, a number as to what that might cost if we were to include that. I don't think that people know how much it costs or what, you know, what value it is and whether people are willing to pay that. I just think it would be something good because it still comes, keeps coming up. Thank you. Um, I have one comment. Uh, my one comment would be, yes, we're still being a bit reactive, but listening to some of our fellow municipalities, I think we, in the last few years, have made some really big strides in trying to keep up uh, when you look at our I&I, &I, our infill and that's it. Um, so we are making strides to move forward uh, further ahead than some of the other municipalities. So it has cost us a little bit, but I think because we're doing it slowly, it's not costing us as much as some of the other municipalities that are all of a sudden going to be thrown at it and they're going to have to come up with it all at once. So I do give kudos to staff for that part of it. And uh, welcome Councillor Schinbein, who is at a uh, at government house at a function. Any other questions at this point for engineering? All right, we'll move on. <clears throat> okay, this is just a quick overview of the uh, Department of Development Services, uh, what our purpose and functions are and how we spend our money. 
Um, I've kept this fairly short because you did get a, a pretty full presentation on development services a couple of months ago. So our, our mission, our mandate is to work with residents, developers, businesses and council to develop and, oh, sorry, thanks. <laughs> and implement long range planning policies and regulations to ensure a vibrant, livable and sustainable community. We have six primary areas of service, um, long range planning, development approvals, information services, economic development, subdivision approvals, and assistance to committees and commissions. And unlike some departments which are broken down where one staff person has specific functions, um, we actually uh, have all of our staff working on all of those to a greater or lesser degree depending on their skills. And who makes use of our services? Uh, we get a lot of inquiries from residents and property owners, um, also from local businesses and people who intend to move in here. Uh, or would wish to, um, from the development industry, from visitors and tourists, from council and committees, and from other government agencies. And by other government agencies, I mean things like the CRD, um, provincial <coughs> ministries, and uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing. These are all agencies that require information from us and that we report to regularly. We have a very small staff. Um, I'm the director for the next seven days, <laughs> and then we have someone new coming on board. Um, Every day it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> We're very fortunate that our senior planner, Trevor Parks, has been with us. He's just coming up to his four-year anniversary, and so I feel very comfortable that in the interim he is going to be able to um, assume responsibilities. And our planning assistant, Karen Hay, has also been with us for just coming up to three years. So between them, there's a lot of experience. and. Uh, you know, we um, break down things a little bit, but basically all three of us um, come and answer counter inquiries, answer the telephone, talk directly with residents and developers, and we collaborate on things. If one person doesn't have the answer to a question, uh, we get together and, and brainstorm to come up with a solution. And the last member of our staff is Marie Lepham, who is our half-time position, which is shared with engineering and public works. And again, we're fortunate that Marie has been with us for 20 years and knows pretty much everything about the municipality in every department. So uh, we, we do have a small staff, we do manage. Um, some of the challenges that we have though are the fact that um, the half-time position in office admin is getting increasingly difficult um, to maintain because there's more and more responsibilities that keep coming her way. So whether it's Marie or another person that eventually moves into that position, that's one of the challenges that we have. So our core service levels, um, a lot of our work is generated um, by land use applications. Last year there was 113 reports came to council, um, most of them associated with applications to make OCP and zoning changes, um, development permits, variances, and occasionally subdivisions. Um, we do policy development, we review our bylaws regularly um, to ensure that they're relevant and that new issues, issues are addressed as needed. And other projects are undertaken um, when they're identified in the um, strategic plan or when council asks for, for specific things. So some of the things that we've dealt with in the past are a discussion on infill housing. We had a couple of open houses last year. Um, it's not on the chart there, but on the, you know, our, the squirrel uh, by lot issue. These are things that come up unexpectedly, but they all take up staff time. And finally, encouraging and fostering economic development is an ongoing activity. Um, we're always trying to promote the community and trying to do what we can to encourage people to invest here. So in terms of how we deal with um, the level of service, information requests are answered almost immediately. Um, requests for permits and applications are processed as quickly as municipal bylaws, council policies, and relevant provincial statutes allow. And major studies, bylaw reviews, and special projects are done according to their priority in the strategic plan and as our resources allow. So just to go over some of these six areas in a little bit more detail, the first is planning, then development approvals, information services, economic development, subdivision approvals, and assistance to committees and commissions. Planning is developing and reviewing policies, as I mentioned before, making sure that they're current and enforceable. Um, the major policies are the official community plan. Um, the plan that we have right now was adopted in 2007, which means the preparation of it began in 2004. So it's coming up to, you know, in the next year or so, it will be ready for another review. Um, the zoning bylaw, we've been working for the last uh, 14 months to try and bring this into sync with the OCP and 
correct some of the things that uh, in a 1993 bylaw uh, don't meet today's needs. Um, we also have development permit guidelines that we review regularly to make sure that those are efficient and then other council policies as necessary. Uh, we research land use issues and other planning issues and report back to council as necessary. Uh, so an example of that again would be something like um, our urban hand policy that was developed a few years ago or the squirrel bylaw or other things of that nature. And a lot of our time is spent interpreting the official community plan and zoning bylaw for the public. Development approvals, um, again, I'll just, I won't read this whole slide because this is again relating to changes to the OCP and community plan. Um, typically these types of applications are the longer ones, they take up to four months to process. Some of the other projects, if the correct zoning is already in place and someone only requires a development permit, that type of application can be as quick as six weeks. And if someone has a development variance permit, uh, again, where they have the correct zoning, but it's just one aspect of their development that needs a variance, that can be done within two months and requires public notification. So that's some of the other things that, are, that take up staff time is doing things like the public notification, sending out letters, preparing newspaper advertisements, scheduling public hearings, and things like that. Um, our second, another category is information requests. So we get a number of inquiries by mail, phone, email, and in person and this takes a lot of staff time. Um, sometimes they're quick questions like what's the age of a building, but other times we get uh, quite lengthy letters from lawyers' offices asking us for um, a list of 26 different items to do with the property, and so that takes some time to put that together and to make sure that our answers are correct so that we don't run into the difficulty of, of having to retract something later on. So I've just given you an example of some of the questions that we get asked most frequently, but there's many others. Um, in terms of economic development, although we don't have an economic development committee any longer, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're still very conscious of trying to promote the benefits of the community, attracting new residents and new businesses. We're trying to make it easy for developers and businesses to get information and uh, licenses when they need them, processing applications as quickly as we can, and just generally trying to create a favorable climate for investment. Uh, subdivision approvals, at the present time, I'm the approving officer, and this is a function that uh, tends to go unnoticed because most of the subdivision applications never come before council. If a, a, a property can be subdivided and meet the minimum parcel size, minimum parcel width, and has a suitable building envelope, there's no need for that to come to council, so those are approved by myself in consultation with uh, the engineering department to make sure that we're getting the appropriate works and services put in. Um, they do take a lot of time, though, um, because there's a lot of going back and forth between development services and engineering, and also talking to the applicants, surveyors, and engineers to make sure that we're getting sufficient information. And one of the last core services is assisting committees and commissions. Um, this department is responsible for uh, being the liaison to the Arts, Culture, and Special Events Committee, to the Heritage Advisory Committee, and the Advisory Planning Commission. Um, so all three of those have different functions. Um, the Arts, Culture, and Special Events Committee, uh, both myself and Karen Hay have been uh, attending those meetings, uh, and also the Heritage Advisory Committee, and our senior planner, Trevor Parks, has been looking after the Advisory Planning Commission. These take a lot of time, not only the attendance at meetings, but um, assisting a lot of time with promotion and advertising of events, researching information, preparing reports, uh, providing orientation sessions, um, assisting with take up and set down of displays for different events, and participating in weekend and evening events. So this is uh, my last slide, and this is just a breakdown to show you 86% um, of, of development services budget, the core budget is spent on salaries and benefits. Uh, there's about 2% spent on conferences, training, and staff development, another 3% uh, on equipment and supplies, 2% on other things, and 7% on legal and professional <coughs> services. And uh, legal and professional services includes uh, cases where we have to contact a lawyer to get more information on how to handle a particular problem, uh, or where we bring in a professional uh, to talk to counsel. For example, if we bring someone in to talk about um, financing to do with the Esquimalt Village Plan, that would come out about 7%. And are there any questions? Yes, there are more. Um, just a sort of a question, I guess, would fall under the committees and commissions, I think. And then you mentioned also there used to be an economic development committee that's no longer in place. And then uh, most recently,
recently with our strategic planning council identified that we would like to have in this upcoming year a, um, I'm not even sure what we're calling it, uh, something along the lines of an economic development task force. Is that something that would fit into development services and in the upcoming budget for 2012, is that something that you put into consideration? Because um, uh, I imagine there, would, uh, while this would be volunteer members from our committee, our committee, <coughs> they would obviously have some expenses attached to this task force. Uh, there's been nothing put into the 2012 budget to do with the task force for economic development. Um, the person who replaces me will be um, tasked with doing economic development. So, um, you know, they may well um, work with council to set up something like that, but that's not um, been planned for right now. Uh, okay, so I guess my question would be if we, well, we, we've committed to proceed with this task force, and then we find that there will be uh, some expenses attached to it, where would those, where, how would we get those? Would that be other, under corporate services, or would it be an amendment to your budget since you haven't planned well, for it? Um, we have an uh, normally c committees and commissions are, are, are established by council and there's terms of reference for them so I'm thinking that if there's that kind of a committee it probably wouldn't come up until next year so it would be something that would be in next year's budget okay thank you Councilor Hodgins through the chair to the retiring Ms. Snyder uh, you mentioned when one of your first slides tourism do you keep information, do you have some stats around what that means for Esquimalt? Unfortunately, no. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were fortunate enough to get a grant um, to hire a, a tourism officer for six months. And they did a fantastic job of trying to promote the community, developing some promotional materials for us. And uh, unfortunately, with, once they were gone, there was no one available to actually try and, and do um, talk to the business operators, tourism operators, to see whether or not um, that had made a significant impact on their businesses, or to see whether their numbers were increasing or decreasing, or to even uh, get a handle on, on tourism, or what percentage of our um, economy it really is. So this is another thing that the new person has been tasked with, is looking after tourism. Thank you. Um, I would just like to take a moment, since I won't be here next week, to uh, actually say goodbye to uh, Ms. Snyder. I've had the opportunity of working with her on the Arts, Culture, and Special Events Committee for several years, and uh, you have been a great asset to that and to our community, and um, you will be missed. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, Council? If there are none, I would like to take just a five-minute recess. I'm sure we could all use a bit of a stretch. Just five minutes. Yes.